And then another important one is to assimilate new people continually, not just to become members or attenders of the church, but to become ministry in the ministry of the church and in the leadership of the church. See, sometimes we're just kind of happy. A, a, a typical sort of traditional church setting is we're just really happy when a lot of people come to church on Sunday. It feels inspiring, right? Wow, look at God's doing things. Got a lot of people here. But the reality is making disciples is not just about getting people in a room on Sunday morning. As much as that might make a pastor feel good, look at all the people who want to hear me preach, that's really not the end goal. We want to make disciples. We want to build strong churches, strong believers. And what that means is as that church grows, as we've been saying along, you've got to grow the ministry with the church. You've got to grow the servants and the leaders with the church. Now let me show you in a diagram what very often happens in church plants. In the launch stage, you have a provisional leadership, which, and the pyramid is, a lot of people are serving. Nearly everybody's ministering. Responsibility is shared. Leadership is transparent. So if you look at this diagram, the leadership is sort of down here, but a lot of people are involved. Because when you're that launch team, everybody's on board. Everybody's serving. There's no room for people just to sort of be casual observers. It demands commitment. So you've got a high level of commitment by these people that are launching it. And then I put this dotted line for the people who are maybe uh, less committed, but there's fewer of them. The majority of them are leading, and they make the foundation of the church. But what starts happening is, as God begins to grow the church, you have more newcomers, and these newcomers are becoming a larger number. In fact, the newcomers may even begin to outnumber your original core group that launched the church. And so what you have is newcomers being partially assimilated. See, the church is still small enough that when a newcomer is, people welcome them. They, they're glad. They're, wow, the church is growing. God's blessing. So the newcomers feel welcomed. The original core, however, is still retaining most of the responsibility to do ministry. So they're the ones that are still doing most of the work. They're leading worship. They're leading Bible studies. They're doing the children's work. They're, they're doing whatever needs to be done, setting up chairs, cleaning up, cooking, making the coffee. They're doing all this work. New people are beginning to come. But what can happen is this. As the church continues to grow, what ends up happening is the newcomers become poorly assimilated and become passive. They're saying, oh, look, at everything's going here. I don't need to do anything. Everybody else is already doing the ministry here, so I'll just let myself be served. And the growing burden of ministry is borne by these few people, so you end up, instead of having a solid triangle with a lot of people serving and leading and few people who are passive, you end up with more people who are passive, and you've got the original core that's bearing the weight of all this new ministry. You've got all these new people. The children's group is growing. You need more Sunday school teachers. The, the youth is growing. You need to, to do more with them. You've got new people coming in with counseling issues. They need somebody to talk to. And all of this growing, growing ministry. Well, that's all exciting. And then also you may have these leaders, and these are the old original leaders, and they're just feeling the crunch of all this work. They're excited the church has grown, but they failed to recruit new workers, and they're retaining the influence. And obviously this kind of a setup is not going to be sustainable very long. That is not a healthy development where few people are doing all the work and they're the old timers that were there from the beginning. And the new people that are coming in are becoming more and more less committed, more anonymous. They're those passive people that come to Sunday. They say, I like to hear a good sermon. I like the music. And then I go home. And over time, what happens to these people? It's not good. <laughs> they can burn out. 
where they say, I just can't do this any longer, especially if they're lay people that are working jobs and they're trying to do all this other, they can burn out and just say, you know, I, I just got to quit. I just can't do this anymore. Another thing that can happen is they can become bitter. They start looking at all these other people that aren't doing anything and they start going, how come I'm doing all the work and they're not doing any work? You know, they're not serving. They need to serve. Well, that doesn't create a very positive atmosphere, does it? And then something else happens. The workers that are down here that are bearing all this weight, they start to lose the joy. You know, initially that was exciting. God's blessing. The church is going. And then they start losing the joy because this is hard. And nobody else seems to be helping. And they come in with these sort of long faces. And uh, you hear them kind of complaining from time to time. They're not exactly radiant. And, and then the other people, some of those, those newcomers, they were, they were, maybe, maybe they were thinking about becoming involved in the church and ministry. But then they go, wait a minute. Boy, look at, those, look at the people that are serving here. They all look like they're really down and out. They look like they're worn out. They don't look very happy. Eh, I'm going to think that over. I don't know if I want to serve in this church if I'm going to look like that after six months. So you literally scare away the potential workers, and then you've got a vicious circle. You've got leaders that are burning out. They're tired. They're not joyful. And then you've got new people that are saying, boy, I sure don't want to serve. And that's really not a healthy situation for a church. And I've known churches, what ends up happening is this usually comes in around the fifth to seventh year of a new church plant. Because the initial excitement and enthusiasm that sort of got that church going and everybody was committed and making sacrifices and working extra hours, they start, they start wearing out. And that's when a lot of churches, they're growing, they're doing well, and then they just kind of plateau and they can actually start going backwards. I've actually looked at the statistics in a couple of denominations on this. And I've found that in new church plants, between five to 10 years, they either learn how to assimilate these new people, expand their ministry, and recruit new people into the ministry to serve, or they go down. And so it's like, well, some of the churches are gonna make it, Others are probably going to start dropping off. They're just going to plateau, and then they're going to settle in. Some of them will settle in around that 50 people number and just really not get over it. And I've actually seen some churches that get to the point to where most of the leadership, one by one, they sort of burn out, they resign, and um, then they can't find new people to even be on the church board. They can't find hardly anybody to, to serve, and that really puts the church in a crisis. So this is going to be a real key if you've got a church that's growing, is you've got to find ways to assimilate those people. So it could maybe, as an alternative, look like this. Where the church begins to develop in a more balanced fashion. So yes, you're still going to, hopefully, God willing, you're going to have newcomers, visitors, new believers. They're not committed yet. But they're quickly assimilated into the ministry of the church. You help them find ways to serve. You make that a natural part of being a Christian. Uh, sometimes people uh, get the idea, well, there's special Christians who do a lot of serving, and then there's the rest of us who just kind of attend. And uh, that's not the spirit you want. You want it to be just the most obvious thing. Are you a new Christian? Find out how you can serve. God's given you gifts. He's given you abilities. He's given you talents. And so you connect those people up with wherever they have their passions, wherever they can serve best. And then as they begin serving, you want to assimilate them into ministry teams on the one hand, so that um, maybe they're on a worship team, maybe they are on a, a youth ministry team, or they're helping with children, or they're on an outreach or a visitation. So whatever your ministry teams are, you help those newcomers become connected and involved and maybe some of them will even become team leaders. Also, cell group, so you get them involved in a cell group. That's where they become committed. Usually, our experience has been that uh, if somebody's just attending on Sunday and going home, attend on Sunday and go home, it's very hard for them to really get well connected with the church. 
But if they can get involved in a cell group, a small group, that's where they become committed. That's where they know people. When they come on Sunday, they see those people they know, they have a relationship with. That's where they begin to develop also their ability to serve one another. See, the small group setting is a great place to begin to experiment with serving. It's not threatening. You know, I could lead a Bible study in a group of 10 people, or I could try to, and if it didn't go very well, it wouldn't be a big deal. But to preach in front of 100 people? Wow, that's scary, right? <laughs> I don't want to try that. So a small group is a great place to begin to experiment, help people discover what they're good at. And so some of those people, they'll become cell group leaders. And then you've got your, your primary leadership team of your pastors, church elders, or maybe you call them deacons. But what you do is you strengthen those original leaders and you even replace some of them with newer leaders. See, what can sometimes happen in a church plan is you have that original team of leaders that were in that launch. They had committed themselves. They made the sacrifices. And they end up in then the leadership team of the church as it continues to grow. But sometimes this can start happening. They start thinking, well, because we were there in the beginning, we have more say in what happens than other people do. And they'll say things like, well, we really know the history here. Or we were here in the beginning, so therefore we should be the ones who get to give the leadership here. And um, so this leadership team has to be open to receiving new people. So it's the principle, if somebody has shown the willingness to serve in general, and then they have shown leadership skills as either a team leader or as a cell group leader, those are the kind of people that you invite then or call to become part of the larger leadership team for the whole church. In other words, remember what Jesus said, he who has been faithful in small things will be entrusted with greater things. And if you've not been faithful in small things, why would we entrust you with greater things? And this is where some churches run into trouble. They don't have intermediate levels of leadership. They say, well, we need to expand our leadership team. We need uh, to call, we need more church elders. There's more ministry. Who do we call? And they haven't had enough other levels of service to be able to say, look, here's somebody who served well on a ministry team. Here's somebody who can inspire the following of other people. Let's call that person. He's been faithful in small things. He's proven his giftedness in small things. Now we would call him to be a leader in the church. And so these intermediate levels of service, leadership of a small group to leadership in the whole church are really important to keep ministry responsibilities shared, to keep your leaders from burning out, to make new people feel apart, to own, have a sense of ownership in the church, to develop their spiritual ministries and make sure the needs of others are being met not just by a few, but by more, to train those future leaders and then to integrate them in. You get fresh ideas also. By having new people come into the leadership team of the church, you get fresh ideas. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. One of the things we did we had an elder board, which was sort of the primary group for the spiritual leadership and care of the church. And then we had deacons that led different ministry teams, so youth ministry, children's ministry, hospitality ministry, and so on. And what we would sometimes do is we would, maybe every other meeting with the elders, we'd invite somebody from those deacons to come and be a part of that leadership team to give a report, to tell us how things are going, that helped the elders know what was happening in the ministries. It helped those people feel that they were part of the leadership. And then some of those people would say, that would be a person to call into uh, the eldership. I'll give you a story about one of the people in our church in Munich. We had a cell church system there, as I mentioned. We had a number of cell groups and that cell group's leader. We had a monthly training for those cell group leaders. And in one of those groups, it was an especially healthy group. 
And, uh, you know, some groups are stronger than that. This was a group that had great cohesion. The people were growing spiritually. They were motivated. They, they really exercised love and care for one another. And the leader of that group was part of the key of it. He was the kind of person who knew how to create that kind of cohesion in the group. And in fact, there was a situation where one of the people of his group kind of disappeared, just sort of dropped out, stopped coming to church, didn't go to the cell group anymore. And the leader of that cell group, like a good shepherd, he kind of went after the lost sheep. I mean, he literally went, you know, found out, went to the guy at the workplace, you know, and the guy wasn't returning calls or anything. He literally sort of hunted the guy down and found him out and in a loving sort of way brought him back into the fold. He, you know, just, and, and when we saw that, he said, now that's the kind of person we want to have as a church elder. He's inspired the love, the commitment, the spiritual growth of the people in his small group. That's the kind of person we want to have leading the church as a whole. See, what sometimes happens in churches, they say, well, we need a leader. And so we look around, we say, well, who's a, who's a fairly mature Christian? And very often we say, well, where's a businessman? See, because if this person can lead a business, then he ought to be able to lead a church, right? Um, he's successful in life, so he ought to be successful at leading a church. Well, that's not always the case. The key is spiritual faithfulness and those shepherding kind of skills. That may not be a successful businessman. That might be a, a, an ordinary factory worker that doesn't have a lot of education, but he has spiritual leadership, cares for the people around him. He's proven himself faithful in small things. That's the kind of person I want to have in that leadership team. And so this kind of development is going to be very key to having a healthy church so that the needs are being met, the responsibilities are being shared. You're constantly developing new leaders and ministries. And it's not depending, weighing on the shoulder of a few.